Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola on this um, holiday weekend. My name is Nancy Hagman, and um, I am a member of this church and have been for several years. Um, at this time, I don't have any announcements um, that are up here on the um, uh, podium, but we welcome you as visitors visiting today, visitors visiting yesterday, and many years of visiting and being a part of this congregation. Welcome. And if you're new today, we especially encourage you to um, speak to one another and have, have us know who you are. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We will then start with um, meditation music um, by Chris Saunders. <laughs> chalice lighting words and the opening words will be said at the same time. We light this chalice in honor of the dove. It's a symbol used by the veterans for peace. Frequently, the dove is associated as a symbol of love, loyalty, fertility, and devotion. It was adopted as a symbol of the first International Peace Conference in Paris in 1949. The dove is also called several names. If you have heard the morning dove, it has dual meanings. Morning being in the morning or in the a.m. when we hear the dove, and also the morning dove, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, as in grief and loss. We also have heard of the turtle dove, of course, representing love. This is often um, used as a symbol frequently throughout religions. Of course, Christianity, there was the dove when we had Noah's Ark. Um, it is also used in Native American culture as the dove and there are spiritual symbolisms that if a dove visits you, that might be someone from your past or an ancestor giving you a message. So today, may our community be visited by the image of the dove of peace. And if you will stand as we say our covenant together, and remain standing, we will also um, have a congregational hymn. Love is the spirit of this church, and service its law. This is our covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. And our opening hymn is number 108. 108, my life flows 
in endless song. And it'll be led by Laura Keith King. <laughs> seated. We have, uh, let me back up just a second. And singing this song, it reminded me that I'm always in a hurry. And this was a song of slow deliberation. And if you're familiar at all with the Quakers, um, they are never in a hurry. And this song was written an early Quaker song. So consequently, may we find peace in just the words and the tempo of our own lives. We have one young person here today, and we have someone that I think would be willing to be with them. Would she like to leave, and we will sing her out? She would, all right. So let's sing her out. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere. Everywhere you may go. And uh, you may not have had an opportunity, but as she left, she turned and hugged her teacher. It was delightful. She recognized her. What better picture of peace. Now we will have our offering, and Chris will um, play some music for us. We are a congregation of um, self-sufficiency, which is really an interesting concept in this world of self-sufficiency. But we invite you to give what you can 
um, share with us and we can share back with you as well. And the ushers will take the offering. Now I, have the privilege, now I have the privilege of introducing our speaker, um, Scott Satterwhite. Um, I have yet to come to a service uh, that Scott has presented that I have not left um, at some level, I want to say elevated or struggling, and perhaps both, with what he presents. Um, the reality or the angle that he presents it always challenges me and there's another piece that I know I need to learn um, and also a joy of hearing that there's one more thing I can learn from Scott and that he's a longtime member here he's a professor at the university and other than that he's a wealth of knowledge please welcome Scott Satterwhite thank you I was ordered to speak slowly, so uh, as a military man formerly, uh, I will do as ordered. <laughs> also, uh, you know, speaking of the Boy Scouts, I had, uh, you know, their motto is to be prepared, and uh, a second before I went on, my glasses broke, <laughs> uh, so I had to go run out and grab some tape. Uh, so. Uh, so we'll see if these dollar store glasses will hold up. If anybody's curious how long your dollar store glasses will last, four years. <laughs> uh, so. Right, uh, so first, I wanted to dedicate this talk to a few veterans who've since passed. Uh, Robert Gravely, uh, Monty Mountcastle, uh, my dad, uh, Bill Satterwhite, and my stepfather, Charles Ramsey. Uh, yeah, most of those have died somewhat recently, and my stepfather died in 2003. Uh, all were veterans. Uh, Robert was in the Marine Corps. Monty Mountcastle was in the Army Air Corps. Uh, he said he flew under MacArthur, maybe not directly, <laughs> uh, but flew with him. Uh, my dad, uh, who was a Vietnam War era veteran, uh, he was a corpsman like I was, uh, and my stepfather, who was a mess specialist, a cook in the Navy. So I just wanted to give a shout out to them in particular. Over recent years, uh, the stories of the first Memorial Days have begun to emerge in the mainstream media. The first recorded Memorial Day services uh, were on May 1st, 1865, when Union soldiers and people freed from slavery marked the day 
to honor those who died to end slavery, and particularly prisoners of war who died in Confederate prisons. The soldiers and recently freed men and women felt such a profound debt of gratitude that they set aside time to mark this day by decorating the graves of the fallen soldiers who died in a war that ended slavery. Not only the white Union soldiers who died in battle or were captured and died in Confederate prisons, but also the black soldiers who more literally than almost anyone in our country's history uh, were fighting for freedom. These were the people that were a part of this, these original ceremonies. Also, historically, remember, this is only a few weeks after General Lee's surrender at Appomattox and Abraham Lincoln's assassination. Step back for a few seconds and imagine, if you can, what that must have felt like in those early days. We might be able to try, but it's hard to imagine what those circumstances would be like. We often describe the people who serve in the military as fighting for freedom, but this is one instance where that term can be, can be applied quite literally. In the years that followed, the ceremony took root and became an official holiday in 1868. General John Logan, a veteran of both the Mexican-American War and the Civil War, is seen as the founder of the official holiday and chose May 30th specifically because that was a day that there were no battles fought. I'm not sure if we could find a similar day like that now. What he originally hoped for was not to promote the traditional values associated with battle, but instead he hoped to make the day one more where we strive for peace over war. We may know the song that is often associated with that time, down by the riverside, with the chorus, ain't gonna study war no more. Sadly, since all the hope that came with emancipation, which we now see celebrated during our ongoing Juneteenth celebrations as a country, we've not gotten to the place where we seem to be ready to lay down our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more. In fact, quite the opposite. For those who have been to a military funeral, you know how moving this can be. I remember when my father, a Vietnam era veteran, and again, a Navy corpsman like I was, who died of pneumonia shortly after getting COVID in the summer of the year 2020, was buried at the National Cemetery in San Antonio. Just how moving a ceremony that was. From this flag ceremony to the playing of taps, it honored his time and service in a way that was incredibly powerful. The flag that the military gave his wife, who after the ceremony graciously gave to me, is the only flag, uh, the only thing I have of my dad's, uh, and is to this day the only flag that I own. During the ceremony, it was hard to keep my composure. Now, imagine that ceremony being performed around the clock. Literally, as my father, father was being buried, I could hear taps being played just a little bit down the way. I also saw another family assembling to lay their veteran to rest. As you might remember, 2020 was a hard year, of which all of us here are incredibly lucky to have survived with the knowledge that not all of our friends and family, including at least one member of our congregation, did not. Now, imagine what it was like during the active war years, whether it be the heights of conflict in Iraq and Afghanistan, nearly all of the Vietnam War, Korea, and World War II. All of the service members who died in those conflicts and the ceremonies that were held for them I have a cousin, Dwight Satterwhite, who was killed in Vietnam. He's not from a side of the family that I'm terribly familiar with, uh, but I visit with his name on the Vietnam Wall downtown whenever I'm nearby. I have another distant relative, 
Ruffin Satterwhite, who's also on the wall. And I'm sure that some of you also have some relatives, friends, family members that are also on this wall. And maybe you visit them too. I have no idea what Dwight or Ruffin's ceremony was like, but I hope that their families and friends got something from that moment when the soldier gave their next kin the flag and set it in their set it in set and it and it set in that neither Dwight nor Ruffin were coming home. At least they're remembered on the wall. I hope their memorial ceremonies were helpful as the families learned to adjust to a new reality as it was setting in because of war in a country few Americans could have found on a map shortly before the conflict began. There's an image from the Iraq War uh, that I've always found to be particularly moving. And that was one where a young woman was laying down by the grave of a soldier killed in Iraq. The soldier's name is James Reagan. He was killed by a roadside bomb in 2007. The woman beside the grave, who is literally speaking into the grave, is John's fiance, Mary. Can you imagine all the hopes and dreams of a young couple dissipating into the ether? Of course, there are a lot of Americans who also died, who weren't getting their due recognition to their service. Until recently, dying by suicide was seen as the equivalent of breaching your contract with the military. I knew Marines when I was serving with the 2nd Marine Division in particular, who died by suicide, whose families received no benefits at all. The battalion I was with was kind enough, if you can think of Marines as being kind, <laughs> um, or a whole battalion at least. The battalion I was with was kind enough uh, to hold full ceremonies for the Marines who died by suicide, but their families got little else, despite honorable service up until that moment. Others, including my friend, others, including my friend, E.J. Smith, an Army veteran of the Iraq War, who lost his leg, had trouble coping, and died of an overdose a few years ago. We're not sure if that's suicide or if that was uh, an overdose or both. Uh, but if anybody saw me perform in Telling Project uh, several years back, uh, it was he was the lead uh, in that. Uh, if you remember one person lost his leg at the beginning of this of the performance that we did. Uh, so, EJ, rest in peace, brother. Others who received other than honorable service, other, other than honorable discharges, despite fighting in wars, may be coming back with an addiction, PTSD, or both, that led to their discharge, those who suffered from military sexual violence, and maybe got addicted to drugs afterwards, got dishonorable discharges because of it, and yet others who served honorably but were in the LGBTQ communities and were discharged for not anything related to their job, but simply because of the military's prejudice. This image is from a memorial to gay veterans that reads, when I was in the military, they gave me a medal for killing two men and a discharge for loving one. How many World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Vets, Iraq War vets, uh, died during the AIDS. I'm sorry, uh, Vietnam vets died during the AIDS crisis, but couldn't receive life-saving care because of their sexuality. Those numbers aren't really calculated, and they're not on memorials, but they're surely out there. During Memorial Day ceremonies, we're often asked to think of the heroes who died in war but we're rarely asked to think about what war means. Politicians pay tribute to the honored dead, but most didn't serve when they had the chance. Some of the biggest hawks of the Iraq War skipped out on the draft when they had the chance to go to Vietnam. And to be clear, I don't fault them for avoiding a senseless war. Veterans for Peace has a whole committee 
devoted to war resistors. Uh, but I do fault them uh, for sending thousands of others, sons and daughters, to their deaths when they came to power. Will any of them be held to account? I think you know the answer. Then we look to the world. In Vietnam, the United States lost over 58,000 troops. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the numbers are over 7,000 American troops. And how many Vietnamese died in what they call the American War? Estimates range between one and three million. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the numbers also range over a million. But who spends time remembering the civilians? I think you all know who does, and that's the families. For Vietnam or any other war, whether in Iran or Iraq, There are no parades honoring the civilian dead. Civilian dead. No major memorials in the country for the civilian dead. There are memorials, however, a few. In fact, we have a small one in the parking lot, which is a memorial for peace. It's right around the corner if anybody wants to check it out. You might have passed it a few times and not thought about it much, but that's what it's there for. There's a major one in Singapore to remember the civilians who died during the Japanese occupation during World War II, an incredibly brutal occupation. If anybody's read the book, uh, The Rape of Nanking, uh, that, talks about, uh, that talks about this in, in Japan, I'm sorry, in China, you know, but similarly uh, taking place throughout where the Japanese occupied. There is another one, that picture right there, that's a smaller one, that's in Massachusetts. But, Few and far between compared to how many war memorials there are. Germany is known for its Holocaust memorials, but it also has at least one to remember the civilians who died during the war, who I know people in this congregation think of often. Other countries do too, but as a whole, it is usually the military that we honor without really questioning why so many died in the first place. This is where Veterans for Peace comes in. Veterans for Peace was founded in 1985 by veterans. And I should also mention that there's a lot of associate members of Veterans for Peace, so you don't have to be a veteran to be in, in Veterans for Peace, but you have to go along with the, the ideas. But it was founded in 1985 by veterans, largely of the Vietnam War, who saw what was happening in Central America and worked against the Reagan administration's push for continued militar militarization in Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and throughout Central and South America. When the U.S. invaded Panama, Vets for Peace marched against it. When the U.S. invaded Iraq in 1990, VFP organized against the first Gulf War. When the U.S. invaded Afghanistan, VFP urged the U.S. to look for another way to deal with terrorism uh, instead of a war. When the U.S. invaded Iraq, that's when I joined. I enlisted in the Navy in 1989 and went to boot camp on June 6, 1990. Back then, if you can remember a time like this, we were still talking about the end of the Cold War. The Iran-Iraq War was over and a peace dividend was actually being discussed, if you can even imagine <laughs> what that would have been like. We certainly weren't talking about war with anyone. When you're in boot camp, if you've never been, you don't get newspapers and you don't watch TV. So I, don't know what to, I didn't know what to think of the day I graduated from boot camp and everyone was talking about Saddam Hussein who had just invaded Kuwait. That was 1990, August 2nd, to be specific. Every year, the VA writes me a letter, and on that letter, it lists that I had wartime service. Interestingly, it lists the other wars, going back to the Spanish-American and Mexican border wars, which I found out later is because spouses, uh, there are still spouses alive uh, from those times, spouses or, um, or dependent children who receive benefits from that. 
but going all the way back to the Spanish-American and Mexican border war. World War I, uh, all of those, I assume, again, for spouses, uh, those who died. Uh, but it lists the dates of the conflict. World War I, 1917 to 1919. World War II, 1941 to 1945. Korea, 1950 to 1953. Vietnam, 1964 to 1975. Gulf War, 1990, through a date to be prescribed by the presidential proclamation or law. So what does that mean? Going on 33 years this summer, that's a long time for a country to be at war, and a long time to have a wartime economy that is always looking for war. It also means that wars never end anymore. I got out in 1999, after serving two enlistments, I served with the Marine Corps as a Navy Corpsman, which is basically a combat trained medic. Even though I never saw combat myself, after I got out of the service, I was a bit lost, like a lot of uh, veterans who get discharged. I was a medic trained in lots of different minor surgical procedures, but without a license to use any of them, I found odd jobs here and there. I was a barista, I worked in restaurants, did manual labor, worked in bookstores. But in 1999 is when I got out. I wasn't sure how to find my bearings as a veteran. I was 26 years old, then the war in Kosovo started. I was unsure of what we were doing for nearly the whole time that I was in the service. That was the war people actually thought we'd be fighting. I get out. And then President Clinton made the decision to intervene. Interestingly, at the same time that he was embroiled in a sexual scandal. All of it seemed a little weird to me and others. I don't get too conspiratorial, but <laughs> it's a little weird. He chose that moment to be the time to jump. Uh, while I look back on that, I'm still not 100% sure if that intervention was justified. Uh, but what I do fall back on is a line that I remember Howard's in a famous historian who himself was a World War II veteran and a member of Veterans for Peace until his death. Sin said, and here I paraphrase, we as Americans are often the ones to say we have to do something when we see conflict in the world. We have to do something. But why does something always mean sending B-52s to do something? Are there other options? There are always other options, but we rarely, if ever, hear them. We hear from politicians and the general and the military industrial complex, but why not ask the vets themselves? What do you think of another war? What do you think of sending your kids to another war? Think about the withdrawal from Afghanistan that played out in the news. Of course, we were all heartbroken over those images of the last planes leaving Kabul and terrified for the people left behind. Yet, how often did we hear a critical analysis of the war itself? How often was the question of whether or not large-scale military, military intervention was even justified in the first place? Estimates range from between 176,000 to 360,000 Afghanis died during that conflict. This includes civilians and military deaths on both sides. At the end, knowing the images echoed the famous photos of the last helicopters leaving the American embassy in Saigon. A lot of us were very shaken by these pictures. One of the big questions being asked was this, was it worth it? Yet, who did the media ask this question to? George Bush, Karl Rove, politicians and generals galore they were talking to heads the, the they were talking to these talking heads to explain why the war was justified and how terrible it was for us to withdraw even former president trump said it was terrible and he was the one who set it in motion nonetheless who was not asked to speak about the war ironically the people who said that we must look for other solutions, like Vets for Peace, and about a billion other 
peace activists and different groups from all over the world uh, who are saying that this war was a bad idea, including people in this room right now who marched in the streets saying war is not the answer. Iraq was largely seen as an unnecessary, as an unnecessary war with thousands of Americans who died as a result of this conflict. Veteran suicides have gone down, but are still alarmingly high, about 16 a day. Will anyone ever be held to account for all the pain and suffering from this war? Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam? Why won't the peace activists ask before or after? So you're a smart person. What is your solution? I'm not saying that every solution would work in every situation, but is peace ever really the goal when the war drums are beating? Why do we rarely, if ever, ask the question, the questions that might one day make a day like Memorial Day, one that has so many less people to mourn, both in our country and others? Who asks these questions? You know who does? That's for peace. Veterans for Peace is thinking long term by looking directly at this country's history with war and foreign intervention, such as this picture here from the School of the Americas protests at Fort Benning. Bill Sloan is in the back here with a hat. Bill and I had marched in these protests that originally started as a protest against U.S. intervention in Central America and continued for decades and still continue, uh, but now they've moved it to the Mexican border because they realize that a lot of the immigration issues that are taking place now are directly related to our military interventions in Guatemala, a country whose government we overthrew in the 50s, in El Salvador, a country who we intervened in directly uh, to, to in, a, in an incredibly brutal civil war, uh, Nicaragua as well, Going, the list can go on. But this is part of these protests. This is a very moving protest if anybody's ever been to one. Vets for Peace has working groups that focus on finally ending, ending the Korean conflict. And although my VA certificate says it ended in 1953, I think many of you probably know that the Korean War never actually ended, just in a long-term truce. We're also looking towards peaceful relations with countries that are often seen as our adversaries, like China and Iran, continual engagement between the Palestinians and, and Israelis, and a very unique, interesting group that doesn't get a lot of uh, press called Combatants for Peace, which is made up of Palestinian combatants and as former uh, Israeli soldiers working together to find peaceful solutions to a very long conflict. Besides the traditional military focus, focuses, VFP, has active working groups focusing on the military's role in the ongoing climate crisis, veteran homelessness, great concern over privatization of the VA, and even peace activities at home, most recently with the Black Lives Matter movement, which VFP took an active role during the Ferguson uprisings as Veterans for Peace's headquarters were in uh, neighboring St. Louis. Yet, when we think of Veterans for Peace, especially on Memorial Day, our first thoughts are almost always connected to war. So lastly, let's work, look at the world right now. The largest conflict that has taken place that has a chance to bring more U.S. involvement is in Ukraine. First off, I think it's safe to say that most of us sympathize with the people of Ukraine. Going back to Howard Zinn's line, are there other non-military solutions that we can work on towards the conflict. Knowing that Ukraine is tricky, is a very tricky issue for peace activists, like Kosovo was as well. Veterans for Peace have worked hard to look towards other solutions. Those include amplifying progressive Ukrainian-centric perspectives, providing material aid to the victims of war, promoting progressive post-war reconstruction without austerity measures. And that's an important part without austerity measures because there's a lot of countries in the world that get trapped into these debt, uh, these, uh, debt schemes 
that many of the corporations put into place as we're trying to rebuild. Advocating for a secure and peaceful post-war coexistence, all the while acknowledging that the direct route to peace, just as it was in Iraq, just as it was in Afghanistan, and just as it was in Vietnam, is a withdrawal of troops, Russian troops, uh, out of Ukraine. Since the Ukraine conflict began, there has always been the threat of nuclear war. And this seems more plausible now. People fear Russia would use a nuclear strike as a last resource. And if they do, what response are you comfortable with? Who else would get involved? Here's a list of the countries with nuclear weapons. North Korea, who are already supplying weapons to the Russians, but also England, France, uh, and Israel, who are directly aiding Ukraine, but also India, Pakistan, and China, who are officially neutral, but lean towards Russia sometimes, sometimes goes back and forth. Then there is, with an incredibly large, ar then there is us, with an incredibly large arsenal of nuclear weapons. With all of this knowledge, what are we doing to advocate for peace at a time where everything could end? We know President Biden has agreed to more military aid, but what do we know of peace talks, active peace talks that might actually bring about peace? Again, returning to Howard Zinn's question, how or does doing something always have to involve sending in B-52s, B-2s, the Marines, the Navy SEALs, or are there other solutions that we have not exhausted, peaceful solutions? Who's working on these issues on Memorial Day, on every other day? Veterans for Peace. I know several of you were here recently when Veterans for Peace members came to this congregation to talk about the Golden Rule. This was the name of a ship that was sailing to raise awareness of the continuous and growing danger of nuclear war. I say growing danger of nuclear war. I know a lot of you are a little, a few years older than I am, uh, but I know as a child growing up in the 80s, that was always my biggest fear. Think about nuclear winters, what nuclear war would look like. Uh, there was a TV show, if you remember, called The Day After, and the first episode was everything was great, and then just any other day, and then the la towards the end of the episode, you saw these nuclear weapons flying from the sky. Everybody was looking at that. What are those? And then realizing quickly what was about ready to happen. And everybody, the thing I remember is when the bomb dropped in the TV show, the bomb dropped, everybody's car stopped, the electricity stopped, and that was the first thing they remembered right before the wave. Every single time to this day, whenever something doesn't start, my car doesn't start right away, I, think, I look back, I think, if I see a weird cloud in the sky, I think, looks kind of shaped like a mushroom. Back of my head, I wonder. So we don't think about it as much now. But if you've been following the doomsday clock, it's just as close, if not closer, than it's been in a long time uh, to us. Somebody pressing that button. And it can happen. It's been threatened numerous times. So going back to the ship that was sailing around the US to raise awareness of the continuous and growing danger of nuclear war, I should say the US, it also went to Cuba and a couple other spots. Think of where the ship gets its name from, the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When we entertain, or when we even entertain the idea of tactical nuclear weapons, what would that look like where you live? If we know that this is a risk in Ukraine, just as it was being discussed in Iraq, if you remember, in Vietnam, if you remember, or you don't know this, Johnson had discussed this during the Battle of Quezon as a possible end to the stalemate. You know, General MacArthur was fired during the Korean War for pushing that in China. And thus elsewhere, why not? And you know that also that Vladimir Putin has been talking about this fairly openly now. And then this leads us to say, what is our response to one person dropping a bomb? They're not verbalizing that much but I think we know what the response might be. So if we know this, I think this is fairly clear, 
then why not work towards peace right now while, we're, while we are still here? Now, Veterans for Peace is not a pacifist organization, I do want to make that clear, uh, but a realistic organization. And we know that there are always other solutions to conflicts. We've seen them in our own personal lives. We've seen them in our own communities. In this congregation specifically, I know that there have been people that saw problems that we thought were impossible to solve, and people worked actively in this congregation to maybe not solve, but at least find peaceful solutions uh, to conflict that was taking place that took the, member, took the lives of members in this congregation. So we know that this is possible in our lives, in our communities, and know if they're possible there, then they're probably possible within the countries too, if we only strive towards peace. We can find peace if we only look for it and believe it is possible. We do. Veterans for Peace's main goal is simple. That we are a nation, that we as a nation, eventually listen to those songs that were sung after emancipation, before it's too late, and lay down our, our swords and shields down by the riverside and study war no more. For veterans, their families, and all those who've been lost to war. I have the sincere hope that we remember everyone who died in war as a result of the war, as a result of wars, and always, 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 in the immortal words of one of my favorite punk bands, Crass, fight war not wars. Let us mark Memorial Day by remembering the dead, and as many of us do so often, but more importantly, let us remember the dead, but fight like hell for the living. Thank you. I'd like you to stand if you have served in the military or that you are a spouse or connected to someone who is in the military. Thank you. We honor you. Appreciate you. And if the rest of you would stand and join us in song. 159. words are by Robert Weston. 
There is the greatest skill, this is the greatest skill of all, to make the bitter with the sweet and make it beautiful. To take the whole of life in all its moods, its strengths and weaknesses, and of the whole make one great and celestial harmony. Go in peace. Thank mm-hmm. you.